when he was when he was chair, the moderator. chair of something, he said, well, go by my watch. Meet your mom. I want to tell her all about you. <laughs> so we'll get started. We're here to uh, tonight to call the order for the. Can you speak up? Okay, just a minute. Call the order for the uh, village trustees by the select board for this special meeting. Move to move to start the meeting. And I call to order the uh, joint meeting with uh, the village trustees with the select board. So you'll see there is some uh, other things on the agenda. We're going to go right into the uh, public hearing. We do have some uh, rules of the house posted up here. I appreciate it if everybody would. We're trying to gather information so as orderly as we can be uh, and help us with this, the more it's going to be easier for us to digest the information that we get tonight. So if you could uh, follow these rules behind us, we'd appreciate it. Uh, also, a handout, there's a memo in your handout that really gives you the purpose of the meeting tonight. So everybody read that and make sure we try to stay within the content of that. So first of all, if you need to speak, please address the chair. There's two chairs, the village chair, the select board chair. If you're from the village, state that you're from the village and address the chair. If you're the town, uh, address the town. On that, um, on that note, just to, just to see where we are, um, how many people in this room hold town short-term rental permits? If you would raise your hand, please. Thank you. And how many hold village short-term rental permits? Okay. How many hold in the, just the town short term and how many hold village short term rental permits? Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> so, uh, stay, please state your reason for attending the meeting uh, while you're here. Each person uh, has opportunity to speak twice, and you'll be limited to three minutes. Now, I don't have a stopwatch, but uh, please, you know, try to do the best you can with that. Um, please leave the room if you'd like to have a conversation with somebody sitting beside you. And please, let's try not to repeat over and over the same, something that this person said, and then somebody's got to say the same thing, just in a little different way. And uh, please sign in to the meeting so we can track the presence. Now, uh, you know, we want to stay organized because these meetings tend to go on a long time when people start saying the same thing over and over. Um, and uh, I have you all out of here so you can go home and watch the debate. <laughs> <laughs> really exciting things, right? All right. And no, uh, just to emphasize, no decisions are being made tonight at all. This is simply to get input from you. Okay. It's, it's laid out in this memo pretty clearly, I think. So, uh, okay, so we are ready to begin. We are here to listen to you and take your comments. And so please uh, feel free to speak uh, and follow the uh, simple rules. Nobody wants to be first. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jill Nixa, and this lovely lady sold our house to us on High Street back in August. So we're newbies. <clears throat> and I read an article, Woodstock officials clamped down on short-term home rentals, and I was reading it and reading it, and then surprised to see that it was on Tuesday, January 5th of 2016. So I got the feeling this has been going on for quite a while. Um, <clears throat> I've stayed in Airbnbs. They're great. Um, we have an instance on our street 
where there have been five occupancies in the past week. Five. five occupancies of Airbnbers in the past week. They come in the night, they leave in the morning. They come in the night, they leave in the morning. And we just think it's quite excessive. If you're going to have this opportunity for so many people here, you have to have somebody make them follow the rules. And it sounds like if you didn't follow the rules, you wouldn't be here tonight. So all of these people probably do. But it's, it's in a small neighborhood, and it's just constant, constant, constant. Cars coming in, cars going out. There have never been parties, I'll give them that. But I'm just surprised that for three years this has been going on. And there has to be an easier way to watch, uh, to make sure that people are following the rules. That's all we're asking for. Please follow the rules. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Sullivan, I'm a Woodstock resident. I own two homes, one at 62 and one at 65. Hollow Farm Road, that's my property. Um, it's off of Curtis Hollow Road, West Woodstock. Um, I had a bit, bit of the impression there were some licensing and other preliminary matters, but I, we're going right into the, okay. Um, I have been asked by a number of the people who are opposed to the expansion of the regulation of uh, short-term rentals to five acre and forestry to make some, an opening statement and then to introduce people to speak on very specific topics so we don't have a lot of double talk and crossing the lines and hearing it three times. And, and So um, I'd like to start by saying I, I got into this business, I am a short-term rental. Uh, I bought the, my property 35 years ago. 25 years ago, I built a house with the hope that it would be for my grandchildren. It's a big house. Uh, my grandchildren had different plans. They <coughs> wound up in San Francisco and Santa Fe and New Orleans. Uh, I retired. My wife died that year, and I was left with a very large, large home. I moved into it. I wasn't comfortable with it. I began to rent it out, and I built another home. Uh, I rebuilt a cat cottage on my same property, that's why I have two addresses, which I live in. And I also live in the main house when it's not occupied, such as right now when my family is, all, you know, all of my grandchildren are there enjoying just what I had always hoped. Um, I think there's two basic arguments about why there ought to be regulation of short-term rentals. One is that Woodstock has a long-standing and very serious problem with low and moderate income housing. It's been with us for, since I was here, uh, my career in Boston was I represented developers of low and moderate income housing. When I came up here, I became a member of Habitat for Humanity. In that position, I was asked to look at the feasibility of Habitat building on two lots at Stafford Commons. After a year of study, we decided that even with all the subsidy, all the work, all the hard, we couldn't afford, even with free labor, to build affordable housing at the Stafford Commons site. So it's that hard. It's, I won't under, I, I, I don't want to underplay it. We're not opposed to this effort. We, we support it. But we don't believe that the regulation of short-term rentals is a solution. I think it has many other effects which are negative, but it is not going to change the long-standing problem that Woodstock's had on affordable housing. Second argument is that somehow it's an unfair advantage against motel owners, bed and uh, breakfast operators, or maybe even larger hotels, such as Woodstock Inn. We, what we hope to be able to demonstrate, they're simply different markets. There is change, and change is always difficult. It's always hard to accept that in change things are seen a little differently. But the short-term rental market of, of shared residences is a market that is growing, whether we like it or Woodstock prohibits it or not. It's growing all around us. It will continue to grow. The only thing that will happen if you regulate it totally in Woodstock is it will grow more in, in surrounding communities like Killington. So with that, I'd like to introduce, is uh, Derek now here? I am. Derek. Are you? To address the, uh, some of the questions about uh, low-income housing because he's had personal experience in that area. Please try to keep your comments to three minutes if you would, please. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Uh, 
First and foremost, thank you all very much for uh, coming out today, both boards. Uh, my name is Derek DeMoss. I am kind of representing both the town and the village. I'm a property owner in both the town and the village, and my concerns deal with both of the regulations and potential changes. Um, I apologize, I do have notes, which I'm gonna have to use. It's uh, <laughs> been a long day. <laughs> but affordable housing has always been an issue in Woodstock. Long before HomeAway, Airbnb, short-term rentals have ever offered the possibility for homeowners to pay for expenses. I am the landlord in Woodstock. Trying to offer affordable housing to my tenants is extremely difficult. Taxes are very high. Regulations are strict and costly. Maintenance to repair homes uh, make it an, in, improf or a, not a profitable business. Most existing properties that are priced affordable in the home, I'm sorry, most, most of the properties that are priced affordable require huge initial investment and ongoing capital to keep up with the maintenance. My long-term rental income does not keep up with that financial demand. I rely on short-term rental income to make, that, make up for that shortfall. Time and time again, it is stated that short-term rentals are taken away from affordable housing market. Almost two-thirds of the houses in Woodstock are valued above $300,000. Roughly 50 of the properties, excluding vacant land, are valued at under $300,000. Of those, only 33 are used as short-term rentals. Many Woodstock rentals are listed, listed that are offered spaces that are owned or occupied in the town, a place Woodstock residents call home. These are local school teachers, local doctors, local entrepreneurs, local business owners, town and village volunteers, just to name a few who rely heavily on the additional income to make their home affordable so they can live and work here. About half of all the short-term rentals in Woodstock are owned by Woodstock residents. Currently, almost 13% of the short-term rentals in Woodstock are either listed for sale or have recently been sold. It is said that we don't know how many short-term rentals there are in Woodstock. That right there is potentially 13% less. How does the individual homeowner come into play for the lack of affordable housing? Are we trying to drive down the housing prices for all owners in Woodstock? Are we looking to push out residents and businesses to make room for our affordable housing? Going after short-term rental owners, making rules more restrictive, blocking access to short-term rental income for anyone interested hurts our residents. It will take tourism dollars away from our local businesses. If guests choose to stay in different towns, it will take EDC 1% dollars away from future projects. It will push affordable housing that much further out of reach for our current and future residents who depend on that vital source of income. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Frank uh, O'Connor would like to address the issue of the, the nature of this new business that's growing. Uh, I'm a marketing guy, so I view it through a totally different lens. We've been here and owned a home on Western Dale Road for about 28 years. Um, we have a uh, short-term rental a cottage there. I also have a young millennial son and his wife and child who are in the retail business here, so I, I spend a lot of my time getting young people to come to the community. Um, we're lucky. The market is growing in terms of all sorts of vacations around the United States. In the last two years, we've seen absolutely unprecedented growth for lots of reasons. Families traveling, it's now viewed as education, it's experience, etc. So we've seen a massive growth in the market. Yes, part of that growth has been fueled by <coughs> short-term rentals. There's no question about it. There's lots of data on that because it provides a unique experience and the, you must these days provide a unique experience to survive in in what's going on now if you're a retailer or no matter what business you're in that deals with the consumer millennials in particular are the ones that are really into short-term rentals so this market is going to grow at, it's growing at a high rate of speed it's going to continue to uh, to grow at a high rate of speed um, our competition is not in this room. Our competition is every town, every community, every city who basically is addressing every segment of this market creatively, very aggressively, with whole new ideas and innovation, and they're attracting this consumer. The consumer is giving us a choice. <coughs> they're saying, you can either welcome us in part of your market as a short-term renter or we're going to go someplace else. 
all of my experience says you are not going to change the behavior of the consumer. The consumer says, you either service me with what I want or I'm going someplace else. What we should be doing is optimizing totally our share, and I'll say un our unfair share, of this total market in all segments of that market, aggressively and creatively. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Bob and Cherry um, Belize, We're talking about again the, the benefits of this type of development. <laughs> My name is Sherry Belisle and I live in the village and Bob and I own a short-term rental. Short-term rentals are a boon to our economy. We've always had tourism as our economy and uh, we all know that in foliage season uh, we can hardly find a parking place. The season is extended but we have unique <coughs> experiences here that bring people here. Wassail, book, book stock, events on the green and they keep continuing to grow and more and more people come and when the people come to stay in short-term rentals because that's the new thing to do they don't go to West Lebanon to shop they eat downtown they shop downtown they use our services so it's good for the economy thank, thank you, you. Uh, now I'd like to ask Kat Gray to talk about one issue that I think gets overlooked, which is there's this sense that short-term rentals are simply unregulated, which is not true. Yeah. There's no, never, there is simply, is th there, there's no question that additional, uh, additional regulation, including identifying where they are and how they operate, uh, is always appropriate. But the idea that we are some rogue group of individuals operating without constraint is, is not true. Kat would like to discuss that. Good evening, I'm Kat Gray. Um, I live in West Woodstock and I'm proud to own three, I hate doing this, sorry, <laughs> three short-term rentals in West Woodstock. I'm gonna go from notes because that's a lot easier for me. Um, speaking to everyone's stated concern that short-term rentals are unregulated and unsafe. Um, all Vermont short-term rentals are currently required to conform to several regulations addressing safety, health, and taxation. Is existing state laws require that we submit our 10% rooms and meals tax, 1% of which goes to Woodstock as a special option tax that funds the EDC and all their efforts. All short-term rentals must comply with existing fire, safety, and health codes as outlined, outlined in Vermont Act 10th uh, 2018 special session. Um, these are largely the same codes that govern long-term <coughs> rentals. All short-term rentals must carry appropriate rental property and liability insurance. Creating new regulations that are redundant to the existing regulations would put an additional burden on the town to enforce these. Um, best business practice holds that if we want to stay in business and have highly rated short-term rentals, we all as hosts must closely manage the quality, condition, and safety of our properties. One only needs to look at the reviews for Airbnb and VRBO and to see how guests hold owners accountable for safe, clean, and pleasant stays. Both existing laws and market accountability drive short-term rental owners and hosts to ensure every guest has a safe and fun experience in our homes and welcome them to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make just a little a short closing <coughs> remark. Um, as an operator of a short-term rental for some time now, uh, there's a couple of observations which I'd like to really share with you. One is that the people that stay, at least at my home, typically follow a pattern. They are uh, a grandfather with three siblings and grandkids, people who travel together as a group, like four close foot friends. I had nine women last, last weekend. These people, if given the choice to move, to have a bed and breakfast, or stay, they, they simply won't do that. The, the, I, I can barely remember a situation where I thought the people that stayed, they stayed at, at my home because they wanted an experience. An experience of living in a home, sharing a kitchen, having breakfast together, sitting out on a deck. They can't get that experience elsewhere. It's, it's not a, we are not in competition with one another. 
These are completely separate markets. And this market is growing very, very quickly. Second thing I'd like to say is that there's a downside to all of this. We, we don't like to talk about it, but when many people are now operating short-term rentals because they need the extra income, whether it's because they're in a retirement, whether they're, they're, uh, their properties are uh, too expensive for them to currently maintain because of a change in situation, they're holding them for their grandchildren. Um, these are long -term, often long-term residents. They paid their taxes. They, they've shown up. They've volunteered. And now many of them are being forced out. Even the short-term rentals that were described here are, are, are not making it and are being forced out. That's un very unfortunate. But there's another group that doesn't get any attention. My cleaning lady started her own business to do short-term <coughs> rentals. She has four short-term rentals. She has five women who now work for her. Those are good jobs. They're going to go. And the service industry, when you have a short-term rental, you have to keep it as, as to the highest standards. Because if you don't, they write you a review. And if you get a bad review, you all know what that means. And, and that means that I'm maintaining my farm higher than I would do if it was my own property. <coughs> I do that because I want to have, have guests. All those people depend on uh, my, my, the income from my short-term rental. So this isn't simply a couple of people getting uh, a losing opportunities. This had broad-term effects. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to speak? Yes. Yes, hi. Good evening, everyone. It's, uh, my name's Gail Childs. I've been in town 23 years. Uh, Gail, are you in the town? I'm in the town. I live in Taftville. I came here to open up a bed and breakfast 23 years ago, which I ran very successfully for eight years and decided I didn't like it. I have um, been a realtor broker for 35 years. I practice in three states. I'm the vice president of sales for Brick and Vine Real Estate. I sell a lot of property all over the state of Vermont. You're probably not too familiar with me in a local market because my market's Massachusetts commercial, New Hampshire, and the whole state of Vermont. We do sell a lot of properties. BrickandBondGroup.com, look it up. And I also have in my property, I own five properties in the state of Vermont. I have annual tenants, which is wonderful, and I have an Airbnb room, one. I've had it for five years and it's been extremely successful. We are highly regulated. I would like everyone to look at that site, all of you folks, because we are extremely regulated on that site. And anyone who has an Airbnb room or a VRBO will know that. I've sold seven properties to people in this town who wanted to come here when they wanted to come here and rent their property out other times, which they do. And to your point, it provides much work for people to go and turn these rooms. It's, it's a very lucrative affair. I, however, do sympathize with the folks who have problems with your cars, I do. And I have a solution for it. And I do sympathize with the folks who have a bed and breakfast that they run professionally. Airbnb started off as a, a one-off. And then it became, it grew and grew. Artificial intelligence is here, it's not going away, as you so stated. Mm -hmm. The millennials are here. We're an older group of people in this room. But I am very digitally in mar and I am in charge of marketing for our company. So I'm into all of what's going on in, in the computer world. This isn't going away. So rather than fight it, we have to do it, find a solution. You cannot take away people's income. Mm -hmm. I think this is a little bit unconstitutional to try to um, tell people what they can do in their private homes. If it's affecting the public, it's an issue. I've never had a problem. I'm sure other people have. If you're in the village and you're having a lot of traffic in, in, in cars, that is up to that person to be spoken to and talked to about that. And you must report it to the venue that they use to, to obtain those guests. That has to be told to them rather than argue it. Call the proper people so that you can report it. Okay? Because we get highly reviewed, as you said. Our reviews are tremendous. The regular Airbnbs, I can name them all because I competed with them all, and I never looked at it as competition. I looked at it as, thank God, we have more space for people to come here. 
I sat on the Economic Development Com Commission for three years. I did resign because of frustration on not being able to get much accomplished that I saw fit to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So I just quietly left. However, if you want to grow this town, you cannot prevent people from doing vacation rentals because this whole upper valley, from Queechee to here, we are a second home community and that's what we are, vacation Gail, thank rentals. You. Gail, thank you. Thank yes. You. Yeah, uh, Barry Milstein, I didn't think I was going to speak so soon, but I've been, I've been inspired. I am, a, I'm a, I am I'm an innkeeper, um, but bottom line is all the innkeepers, we're all in the short-term rental business. And a lot of what I've heard tonight sounds like arguments to not prevent short-term rentals. I don't think that is the case here. I don't think anybody has proposed that. Um, uh, Frank said, mentioned optimizing. And I think that's the right thing is to optimize, not maximize. Um, if there are unfilled rooms, short-term rental or, or bed and breakfast rooms that are unfilled, by some measure, there's enough. Uh, there are current regulations that were, were um, worked on years ago uh, for good reason, uh, to protect community, to protect health and safety. Um, and uh, those aren't being enforced. Um, Woodstock is special and as unique with, as we are, we are not different than any of the hundreds of communities across the world that are struggling with the same and recognizing the very same impacts. So it's not a question about, is it impacting us the same way as it's impacting the rest of the world? Of course it is. And it's something we just, uh, we're here tonight and uh, the planning commission and the select board and the, and the trustees are looking to to, to optimize, um, how do, uh, what is the right way to do this? Um, and yep, regulations are uh, different. My understanding is that short-term rental, uh, for instance, fire regulations, it's self-policed. 75% um, of uh, fire deaths um, happen in single-family homes. All of the inns, all of the hotels, they're, they're mostly occupied. Um, they're inspected annually, they've got sprinklers. Um, there's definitely, a, sure seems to be a different level of protection uh, on part of the industry. So I think, uh, I didn't have something to sum up, but, uh, but at this point, um, I just want to be clear here that what we're talking about is just addressing the current um, impacts that we're now recognizing about short-term rentals and, and take an approach to, to optimize uh, what works for Woodstock. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else? John. Over here, John King. John King, sorry. He okay. beat you out. Thank you. Um, my name is John King. Uh, I moved here 21 years ago for a job. <coughs> and during those 21 years, um, I lived in long-term rentals for five, <coughs> uh, short-term for two years. Uh, I built two houses. I re rehabbed uh, uh, the house I'm in currently. Uh, tried to build two other uh, additional housing um, with the excruciating process. Um, the business that I've uh, worked for for 21 years uh, was in significant disruption. And what I mean by that is when I came here 21 years ago, there were seven distributors. There's only one left. And that is due to technology, Amazon, and the such. Um, I serviced a lot of the bed and breakfasts, the motor inns, the hotels. I, I did most of them in the state of Vermont. That business is in disruption as well. Uh, the way people travel is changing. And um, <clears throat> for the business I, I managed for 21 years, we didn't go to committees to make rules so that I'm protected. I, we needed to innovate. We needed to be a super host. We needed to be invest in our business so that people continue to come back. Nobody gets a free pass. I don't have any regrets on that side. It's just hyper competitive. The, the other side is I believe in a free market. I believe that people like myself, if I <laughs> I must have said something wrong. I'm so sorry. Could I ask the gentleman with a camera to please leave the building? Um, so I, I lost my thought, but um, you believe in the free market. I, I, I believe in the free market. The people should, if they wanted, if I want to choose to live here. 
I should have the right to be able to rent that out so I can live here. And I think the other thing is you're, we're cutting our nose off despite us. When people, if you want people to move here, the best way for them to experience is living in a house, living in a community, so they can really see what it's like. Good point. Yeah, Thanks, you John. were next, lady. Um, <laughs> Sally Garman, sorry I was late, I, so I didn't hear the rest of it. I've lived in Woodstock about 35 years. Um, I've been in many different roles, but we want our community to be a community. And if you have so many short-term rentals, you use that community aspect because you're never sure who's living next to you. I have no problems with people doing Airbnbs if they live there. But I do object for people who are out of town who come up and buy a house and then rent it out and then come up maybe once a year. Um, I have a grandson living with me. He cannot afford an apartment in the area. Um, you know, he's young, he's 24. There's nothing affordable uh, in Woodstock. We have a lot of people who are working in the service industry. They cannot afford to live here unless they live with parents or they inherited a house. Um, we are losing so many families with children. Our schools are cutting down. So I think short-term rentals, um, if the people live on the property, that's one thing. But, but if they're not living in their house when it's being rented, um, not the weekenders, then I object to it. Thank you. Yes. Okay. <coughs> um, Susan Fuller, I live in the town. Um, I have been a resident here on and off since, well, I graduated in 1969 from Woodstock High School. Uh, I'm here tonight, um, and it's hard because my father died two nights ago. He has a farm, 380 acres, that's been in the generation for four, four generations in our family. He died a poor man two days ago because he could not afford to pay his taxes and he's living there by himself and it's now going to my, my nephew. But the point is, I live here in Woodstock. I don't want to be that way. If I want to have and rent out my house because I can't afford my $18,000 in taxes, I would like to be able to have that apartment, to have that income, to supplement my income. My father wasn't able to do that. His farm was a dairy farm. He couldn't turn it into something else. Well, we farm the tourists. And if that's what can make me be able to live in my home, I'd like to be able to do that. And I'm in an area that is in the five acres and then close to the 25 acres zoning. And I don't see that we need to change our rules and regulations. We thought about those in 1973 very, very carefully. The village is very different than all of the rest of the area. And I think we really need to think about keeping that the way it is. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sarah I'm and I own a house in Woodstock. We are second home um, owners, um, so we, I suppose, represent those people who aren't here year-round. Um, but to give you a sense of what that means, we live in the village, and we're academics, and we would love to live in Woodstock if we could year-round. We can't, because there's not a university in Woodstock. So we live in Chicago. But we're here all summer long. Um, and we rent during foliage season, and we rent to seasonal renters in the <coughs> winter, to skiers, a long-term rental. Um, and the only way in which we can have this life, we love this town, we tell our friends about it, we have friends who also want to move here because they've come to visit us and they fall in love with it. The only way in which we could do that is if the only way we were able to buy the house was on the supposition that we could rent for periods of time. And so it's made this life possible. So we just want to represent, this is what it means to be a second homeowner here, to actually have a house that you live in and to love this town and to want to share it with others. <coughs> I'm at Dr. Hi, my name is Tim Dorr. I own uh, a, a house in the village. We, I am an academic. I work at a university abroad. We came here because we wanted to be part of Woodstock. I would give my right eye tooth to live permanently in Woodstock, but there's no university here. There's no drug discovery business here, and so that's what I do. I can't do that here, and I think that a lot of people would love to live in Woodstock if they could be working professionals in Woodstock, and they can't. 
So our solution to that is to spend as much time as possible here. We don't do short-term rentals anymore, but we did initially. We managed to find academic tenants who are repeats for us, but I'm sympathetic to the idea that one needs to do this because one might want to come for Christmas holiday um, <coughs> if it were possible. And so I second uh, the previous comment about loving Woodstock and wanting to be a part of it, um, and this is the way we're able to do that. I would like to add that Airbnb uh, sent me um, a fire and smoke detector. Oh, I thought you. Yeah, um, I'm Mary Mayhew. I live in the village of Woodstock. I'm a real estate agent. And I just want to say that most of the sales I have had have been people who are going to be living here full time. But I will say, um, and, fit, and with kids, I did have a sale recently. The, uh, family moved here from California and they stayed at an Airbnb over Christmas to experience Vermont. We picked a house out that week um, soon after and they're living in the village now with two kids going to the elementary school and her parents are going to be moving to Pomfret full time. So Airbnb is a nice, it's just a nice, I have to agree, it's, it definitely has to be regulated. I'm in the village and I believe I've known people who've done short-term regular, you know, short-term rentals, and they have to go through a lot of hoops. And there are fire regulations. They have to have the fire marshal come in. I've known people the amount of money that they spend to get up to code, for, for you know, up to, to file the regulations. But the point is, it does need to be regulated. But it's something we, I think we'd be really ridiculous to just say we're not going to allow or just you know <coughs> limit. It, you know, we, we, regulation is important. And I have to agree with Susan Fuller about the five um, acre um, area. I mean, that's already going to be regulated, from my understanding, is when you do Air and B, you, you have to pay your taxes and you have regulations. Um, I feel the village, I am concerned that that definitely people have to follow. And they're going to be bad eggs who are not following the rules, and those people should be fined heavily. Or shut down. Uh -huh. yes. Please. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think I have one back here first. <coughs> uh, I'm Patrick Fultz. Uh, I moved here July 25th, will be six years. Uh, I own Sleep Woodstock Motel. Uh, I think there's a misconception in this room that they want to get rid of short term rental. Nobody wants to get rid of short term rental. I don't think that's the issue at all. I think the issue is. There are current rules and regulations that aren't being followed and aren't being policed because the town doesn't have the capability to do that. No one's looking to, to get rid of it. And clearly, it's a disruption market, just like Uber and so forth. It's not going away. But we need to really look at what the rules are and that all the people are playing by the rules. So if you want to have a house and, and be here half the year, you know, that's fine. But so long as people are abiding by the rules and making everything correct and fair, then us lodging people won't have a problem. But for me to do a room, I pay a lot more money than a short-term rental does. Just to open that room up. Uh, I test my water on a quarterly basis. I pay an annual fee. I have insurance out the wazoo. Uh, so, you know, it's, all we're looking for is balance fairness, mm -hmm. and people following the rules. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, so everyone here thinks we're trying to get rid of short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. That's not what this is about. This is about keeping a community, having places for people to live, uh, being fair across the board, and figure out how we do this so that there is a balance and that everyone can get what they want. It's called compromise. I know we're not used to that in the United States right now, but we need to figure that out. <laughs> So that's, that's my two cents. I had Randy Mayhew next. I'm going to try a different tack here. This is a <laughs> hearing where you're considering a proposed regulation, section 526, that I uh, printed out from the website. And uh, I just wanted to point out um, your conditional use support statement which also comes from the website, states that changes in ownership require a new permit. That was my 
understanding as a village resident, mm -hmm. and I know it says so in the village uh, ordinance provision. I can't find it anywhere in section 526. I think you've got a, uh, an omission. Check into that, Your Honor. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, for you, uh, for you folks over here, because this gentleman is in the way, I don't see your hand. So have your neighbor. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yes. uh, uh, my, name, my name is Chris Lang. Um, uh, I own some hay fields and woodlands up on Hartman Hill Road in the corner of Happy Valley. Um, I've been in our family since 1972. I grew up in Woodstock, lived in New York City for 10 years, eight years in Chicago, and moved back to the area in 2003, and currently I'm a resident of Norwich. Um, still love the land that we own up there. Uh, I'm not against vacation rentals whatsoever, but I unequivocally think you have to manage the rules as it relates to five acre districts, specifically to weddings and parties and the abuse of ancillary structures for that very purpose in those districts. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else on this side? Gail wants to speak. Yeah, I just want to say one more thing. Um, Airbnb, Airbnb sent to me a um, smoke detector and a um, um, carbon monoxide detector. So they actually sent it. They sent it to their people. Oh, they're very, very aware of safety for the guests. Thank okay. You. Uh, I, I have another question for you. No, no, Butch, I, I would like another question, please. Where did this impetus come from? Who started this process? Why are we doing this at all? I'd like to know, have an answer by you folks. Thank you. Please respond. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, up the aisle. I'm Jennifer Felvey. How are you? Hi. Good. Um, my concern is, as a realtor, I moved out of the village, I live in Pomfret, but I sell real estate in Woodstock. Okay. And as a realtor, I can tell you, I haven't really taken careful notes, but many people ask whether or not a house can be airbnb So if we follow through with the suggested moratorium, the houses that currently have permits will be worth more financially than the houses that do not. And in addition to that, I would like to comment uh, about the sense of community. I lived on Elm Street, and uh, so I was all, you know, I'd walk all over town, and the neighborhoods that had more Airbnb uh, residences had a greater sense of community, a greater sense of life. <coughs> on Elm Street, there are lights out. Most of those people come maybe once a year. I find a community that is thriving and happy and busy far more attractive. And the people who are going to buy a house, an Airbnb it, can only do it in the village six times a year. That means it's now available. That house is available to someone who's less wealthy. And they need the Airbnb to be able to afford that house. But they're going to be here. They're also going to be here more than the people who just buy a house in order to long-term rent it out. Those houses are going to go, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to be maintained the way a house that is airbnb is. It's good for this town in many ways that far outweigh the occasional disruption. I did Airbnb, so I know whether or not there are disruptions. And Airbnb handles that. Um, so I, I, I just feel that we are stigmatizing the houses that don't have permits. They will be worth less than houses that do. Back, back, back row up there. I'm Dan I'm in West Woodstock. I'm an innkeeper. Um, and personally, I think that as long as people who run Airbnbs fall under the same rules and regulations that other um, people in the industry do, then, then it's fine. And as far as regulating how often they can rent it, I, I think a blanket statement is not really what we should have here. And I have a particular instance because I'm trying to sell my inn, and I had someone who wanted to buy it as a vacation rental. And my understanding is the reason it, it, there's regulations for Airbnb is because of the 
traffic, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I can tell you that we have more traffic now than if somebody was renting it out as an Airbnb. So why should I, why should I lose the sale of my place because of that? You know, I don't understand that. So I think that needs to be looked into. Me? Mike. Okay, I'm Nancy Hoblin. I live on High Street. We have an Airbnb right next to me, John Bruno's old building. There's nothing wrong with a short-term rental, but when the rules are not enforced and there are five, five, five separate guests in one week, this guy has been doing this weekend after weekend after weekend after weekend after weekend and nothing is done. The point is he's breaking the rules. He's making it bad for everybody else. Somebody should do something about it. Yes. Airbnb doesn't do anything about it. They don't care how often he yeah, rents it. Uh, I'd like to read a letter that came in. Uh, I requested that this be read from uh, another Woodstock resident, Susan Ford, who is uh, a local lawyer and a Woodstock resident. Um, I apologize. I cannot attend the public hearing on June 27th. I hope you'll accept this letter in lieu of the public statement I would make if able to attend. I support the moratorium on short-term rental permits while the appropriate governing bodies consider revising our current regulations. I've read articles, listened to podcasts about what has happened in other communities when restrictions on short-term rentals are inadequate. There are corporate entities that buy homes solely to rent on a short-term basis. Entire streets become ghost towns other than tourist season when they have constant turnovers of tenants. While that has not happened in Woodstock, it could. Imagine High Street with no permanent residence, just short-term rental houses. Another concern is what short-term rental purchase does to our housing market. My understanding is that the EDC is working to bring people to actually live in Woodstock and be part of our community. When affordable housing is purchased for short-term housing, <coughs> the opportunity for someone to buy the home or rent long-term in part of our town is lost. Lastly, I think it is important to note that the actions being taken Thursday night will not affect anyone that presently has a permit for short-term rentals or is renting homes in areas that are presently exempt. The goal is just to hit pause and study the president or, or present ordinance and, I assume, look at what other communities are doing so that we have rules and regulations that make sense in our town and village. I'm confident that open hearings will continue and everyone will have an opportunity to continue to voice their views in this process. <coughs> Sincerely, Susan Boyle Ford. I'd just like to... Um, associate myself with Susan's letter. I think that's a very good, sensible, mindful approach. Nobody's talking about shutting down short-term rentals. Nobody's talking about setting into some kind of owner's regulations. We're talking about looking at a changing marketplace. I don't know, when were, the, when were these regulations written? 2002. It's been a long time since 2002. The internet has obviously changed a lot of things. I think it's a good time to hit the reset button. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, yes, Hi, I'm Brenda Blakeman. I have first impressions. I have worked in Woodstock for 34 years, and I now have a home here in Woodstock. I have two short-term rentals. Um, I was actually the first person in Woodstock to get a conditional use permit. I try to follow every rule that there is. I have never had any tenant be inconsiderate, rude. Mm -hmm. I never hear a word out of them. That nice gentleman over there that just spoke was a tenant of mine at one point mm -hmm. who also turned around and bought a home right next door to me. <laughs> um, and I've seen that well, situation. I've had that situation happen more than once. Yeah. I've had people stay at my place that were receiving treatment at Dartmouth Hitchcock from Arizona because they had cancer. Um, I really feel that times are changing in Woodstock and we really need to sit back and take a look at it. And I agree that we all need to play on the same playing field. But I think that um, if, if there's a problem like on your street, mm -hmm. 
I don't know what that problem is, but you need to figure out who you need to talk to about that. But his name is Michael Brands. All right. Well, but uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> but but as, as an example, if you look on the green in Woodstock, how many of those homes are left empty right. all the time? There's never a light on. For years. That's right. And and I'm and the same on Pleasant Street, and and, and the Street. same on Elm Street. I personally would rather see a light on and a car in the yard and a dog barking mm -hmm. and kids out playing than to see the lights off and have these homes just be sitting still. So I really think that we need to figure out the right rules and the right regulations for everyone to play with. And I, I think that it's good for everyone's business. Um, the other night I went to an open house at the Woodstocker bed and breakfast. And I had never been in that place in 34 years that I've been in Woodstock. I went there to their nice open house and I would totally recommend anyone to stay there. Their facility is beautiful. And I think that we need to do things like that to enhance and grow all of the different businesses that we have here in town. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mary. So I just want to, my understanding what Randy you know, brought up is, you know, when I've told people who are interested in purchasing a property to do short term, I always tell them that they have to get a permit. Even if the property is already permitted to do it, that's the way I read, I've got the, the regulations, that they, that permit is done when the place is sold. They have to go and get their own permit. My understanding, if there is abuse of you know not doing you know not doing your you know you're doing more than the six um, short-term rentals a year. That Michael Brands is the person who you address that issue with, correct? Yeah. So how come I heard, I saw people shake their head that Michael Brands is not the person? I thought he was the person that you would contact if you had a neighbor who was abusing the um, you know the, the short-term regulation, and I thought there was a fine. You work for it. Okay, so there are regulations. Yeah you know, and they just need to be enforced. Yeah. And they're very sensible, and I think they're very reasonable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Barry's behind you, I had to hand up first. Yeah. Um, he has three minutes to speak. I don't need, I don't need to ask a couple questions. One, also full disclosure, our, uh, one of our older children is coming with our three grandchildren this summer for a month. They're staying in an Airbnb house, so we're not. <laughs> I do have a question about uh, the, the realtors. So, are they aware that um, is it economically viable for them to purchase a home if they are limited to six and ten in the town? Do they are they aware of that? Oh, we, I tell them. Yeah, I, aware. Yeah. I I tell them right off the bat if they're interested in doing short-term rentals. I tell them here are the regulations. This is what you have to do. Yep. Very clear about it. Got it. And go okay. talk to Michael if you've got any questions. you got to go apply for the permit. Yeah, and nothing's right. a given. Okay, and then the only other thing is, is to, um, I think we, if we don't have to, we should not create a situation where we require neighbors to be accusing other neighbors That's of true. things. Ideally, right. this would just be work without issue. putting neighbors yeah. in, a, in an uncomfortable situation like that. That yeah. impacts community. I agree. That's true. Yeah. I agree. Thank you. Uh, anybody else have something else to say? <laughs> <laughs> I do, thank you. Um, my name is Brian Coyne. Um, I'm a seasonal resident. And listening to everyone here tonight, I've been struck by the fact that there's, I think, if I've read the situation correctly, more consensus in this room than I had anticipated. Um, and that leads me to, the, to just one observation, which is that my sense of this hearing was that it was um, an attempt to, to determine whether or not the information gathered warrants an emergency situation. Now, I'm not sure how the board interprets what constitutes an emergency situation, but given the consent, the relative, relatively speaking, the overlap that I hear um, from those who have genuine concerns mm -hmm. about enforcing regulations and those who support long, uh, short term rentals and those who have con some concerns about them, it seems to me that it's possible that the board would consider um, reviewing regulations without right. um, identifying the situation as an emergency situation. Thank you. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Cynthia Stevens. I've just moved to Woodstock for the town. And in listening to uh, what I've heard tonight, you know, two things come out. First, as an issue, is the enforcement. That is separate from the need to change regulations. I'm not understanding what regulations would be changed. Mm -hmm. However, the concern that people have, and that I also would echo, is outside bodies either real estate companies or corporations buying properties and renting them. You know, I personally would be opposed to that. And if that is something that this board would look into, it would make a lot of sense. But I don't see an overhaul of the regulations based on what I've heard here. Thank you. I would just like to um, double down with Gail Childs and ask what the origins of this situation were. How did this start? Why are we here? I'd like to know what you know exactly when this began. What tipped off this concern for short-term rentals, and uh, why there's a proposed moratorium on it? Right. I think uh, Joe would speak to that. Um, so I was part of a group of people um, who listened to the housing study earlier this year, and made up a working party with with people who were residents, um, owners of bed and breakfasts, and just concerned people. Um, because we saw some statistics in the housing study that, we, uh, that concerned us. And as we did our research, we looked at what was going on around the country and around the world to find out that many cities and towns are changing their regulations on short-term rentals to, um, to regulate what is happening very, very quickly because everybody is noticing the same issues where neighborhoods are being disrupted, um, long-term rental opportunities are decreasing, um, and the ownership opportunities for purchasing houses are changing, and that's what our housing study did. So we recommended to the Planning Commission that, uh, we, we presented that to the Planning Commission. We found out that the Planning Commission has been looking at reviewing these, changing the regulations for some five years, and they've spent that long talking about it. In those five years, we've probably given about 25 new permits, and each time we give a permit, that property is grandfathered. So we cannot change any regulations for that property again. So it seemed like a good opportunity to press the pause button, to change the regulations to reflect what's really going on in the marketplace, come out with regulations that make sense for everybody, and not give out any permits while that's being done. That's it. Anybody else who hasn't spoken? Mr. King? <coughs> I'd like to thank you for all your work on, on the EDC and things. I, I read that study, and my perspective as building two rental units, building two houses, rehabbing a house, and getting a permit for four new houses, I, I disagree with that. And I, I feel that, um, you know, a lot of residents that live here are in survival mode. I don't, I don't see it taking rental and come away. It's allowing a family to keep their house and stay there and visit at the same time. You need to look at uh, Western Europe, Look at Italy, look at Ireland. It's very similar to Vermont. People are leaving all these villages. They're giving homes away in Italy. Just Google it. If people are leaving in droves because they can't afford to live there, they're moving to the cities. Same here in Vermont. They're moving to Burlington. You know, this is a second home market. I think that um, I, I, I can respectfully disagree with that housing study because I've, I've done all those categories. And I think you really need to look and allowing people that live here the ability to stay. Thank you. Anything new? Yeah, anyone? Anything new? Any, any, there's a lady over there who hasn't spoken. Hi, yes. I'm uh, Marisa Serafini, and we have a second home um, in the village that we rent occasionally. Just as a follow-up as to whether uh, those houses potentially could be available for long-term affordable rents or long-term affordable housing, I would just be interested in going back to the person who said whether the number was 30 or whatever were under the $300,000 uh, range. But I think it's worth exploring um, how many homes potentially we're looking at that could be part of an affordable housing uh, market. So. Thank you. 
Thank you. Anybody have anything different? Or yeah. who, anybody who but hasn't spoken? I, I do think there's one thing that, that hasn't been mentioned, and it <laughs> goes to the, the point that, that Mary was bringing up. One of the problems and one of the reasons that I was encouraging everyone to do this moratorium and hit the pause button is because you know I sit on the VDRB, which is the Village Development Review Board, and I know that Michael receives complaints frequently from neighbors, of people who are abusing our current regulations and renting far more than the six times per year allowed ex outside of foliage season. His ability to do anything about that is minimal. He can write a warning letter, he can issue very minimal fines. If he wants to do more, then that involves a very expensive lawyer, it involves taking it to, it's a court case. It's, it's so, his, his ability to do anything about it is almost nil. So it's almost, I mean, to have regulations that you can't enforce, to have these yes. toothless regulations. Why would that be? So that's why we want to hit the pause button and rewrite our regulations, yeah. because okay. they were written far before Airbnb okay. existed. That's, this is it. Okay. Last but I just wanted to put that up. Karen, we're here to listen. Last question. Oh. Last, mm -hmm. last comment, rather. Thank you. Um, one question and concern that I have about the moratorium that's proposed is, I know there's at least a couple people here in the Planning Commission. One thing that I've noticed recently is one line item in the Planning Commission minutes uh, and uh, uh, calendar is that discussing village uh, review and changing village uh, zoning has always been on the list and it's usually put off because there's no time for it. I'm just wondering if we remove the incentive to make changes on um, short-term rentals and say there's a moratorium until we can figure it out, where's the incentive to get to the root of that problem? And, and that's, I think, my biggest concern about the moratorium. I know there's a time frame and there's, there's limits on what you can and can't do. <laughs> it's just a concern for me that why is that not going to become a, we ran out of time, it's 9 o'clock, the debates are on, let's get out of here, we'll deal it with it next month. And I think that that is probably my biggest concern about the moratorium right now, that it'll just stop all potential uh, short-term renters. <laughs> And it'll just, I understand, put a hold on it, but where's the incentive to actually work on the progress? And that is, I think, one of my concerns that, that I'd just like to bring. Something to. Anything else? If not, we'll appreciate it. You've had your time. Yeah. We have to be fair to everybody. Uh, we appreciate your coming and. Uh, Appreciate all your comments. Thank you for all good those comments. comments. There were a lot of good comments, uh, a variety of them, and we're going to take them all into account and decide what we'd like to do. You will all know. Thanks for an organized meeting, but I kind of missed the entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> good job. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Okay, go for it. Thank you. So we have. Uh, could you please, Randy? Randy. Out the door, downstairs. Don't shut the door. We're not in the executive session. All right. Uh, for in the village, we have approval of the village road and bridge standards. This is basically uh, this gives us the ability to uh, get. Uh, money from the state that we might be entitled to. I would entertain a motion to accept. So moved. Seconded. Is there any discussion on, on that matter? No. Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, and a motion carries. I make a motion to adjourn, adjourn for the village trustees. Second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Very much. See ya. The room is yours. You're good, Aye. Phil. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Please leave. <laughs> <laughs> Take your conversation down to the lobby. <laughs> Come on, I don't even want to be there. Back exit. I take the elevator. Elevator. Is there a window right I can just? No, no, no. Um, the fire escape is right there. Yeah. Yeah. Go right down. Go right down. No. no. <laughs> what she does? Yeah, you can go out that way. <laughs> Tonight. All right. So the first thing on our agenda is the liquor license, and that is for Three Elm Street, which I believe is uh, Bentley's. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we have that before us, and we have the appropriate fee, and uh, and this is um, a liquor license. All right. Okay. Um, all paperwork seems to be in order. I make a motion to approve. I'll second. The motion's been made and seconded to approve the liquor license for 3 Elm Street. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, this is um, liquor and tobacco on um, one application. Just to want to. Um, I don't know that we regulate tobacco, do we? No. no. No regulate tobacco. No, but they have to get a state license. Step, step, yeah. yeah. Not anymore. Okay. Do. The next thing is the review of the bids for the Prosper Road. Phil, would you explain that, please? I, I will. So, this was a grant I applied for and got, and it's $140,000 to Woodstock. It's for the road that runs between the farmer's market and the Prosper Schoolhouse. Both ends are paved, both ends will be repaved. Ditches will be brought in line with current Vermont standards and money left over will be put into gravel. Uh, so this was approved by the commissioner like Monday or Tuesday of this week. We had it out to bid. Knotts is a very responsible contractor. Personally, the town has done over a million dollars with Knotts. A lot of it post Irene. They're very reliable. And a little bit. So do we have 77,000 in our budget to pay for the remainder of this? You have money in your paving to offset the paving side. You have money dedicated to the ditch work. Uh, and other road work. I make a motion we uh, accept the bid of uh, Knott's Excavating Number 3, 
three beds, uh, three twelve, two five nine, and two one seven. He was a low bidder. Like Phil said, he's very reliable. He did a good job on our uh, yard down to the emergency services building. And he did the town garage. He did all kinds of work for us. So he's done a good job every time we've hired him. So I recommend we accept the bid from Knox. That's a great Motion's been made. Seconded. Second. Seconded. Second. Ray seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 While we're on that subject of $140,000, yeah. I just think that it would be a good time to say that in this past year's budget, which doesn't show up, I, I don't know where it shows up, Phil has obtained $175,000 a grant or money from the state for the North Street project yeah. that didn't cost the pack taxpayers anything. $175,000 for the Dunham Hill project, which didn't cost the taxpayers $175,000 out of their pocket. And uh, now this one, and I think there's a couple other small there's ones. Some other there's some others that I'm not aware of, but um, John Dalton labeled Phil years ago, Mr. Grant. <laughs> so, <laughs> We appreciate that, Phil, and Thank for you, going Bob. after that money and uh, speak for the taxpayers. So a uh, motion was made and carried to accept that bid from not. The next one is the uh, 100 uh, endurance race. This is uh, goes on every year. I'll make a motion to accept the request. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded to accept it. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 The ayes have it. So the other one is the approval of the town road and bridge standards, which uh, I don't know what if we don't approve, if should we not approve this, that limits approve. the money we would you get. You would not be eligible for that hundred and forty thousand for example. <laughs> Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the, road, the town road and bridge standards. Second. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve that town and road and bridge standards. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 The ayes have it. And what's the last one? The WWTF biosol. That's the treatment plant. Oh, yeah. This is the world has changed. We have. We take in raw sewage, we put clean water in the river, and we scoop out everything else, save it for six months, and spread it on farm fields. Billings Farm sold all their equipment. Tom is buying his corn. We're going to have to do something different with our sludge. And I'll have more information for you in July. But most likely, We'll have to hire a company to come in and dewater our sludge and then haul it away out of state. Is there no other farm that wants it? No. The rules and the regs have gotten mm -hmm. terrible. So, for example, the rule used to be spread your sludge and then incorporate it into the soil. Now, no more incorporating in the soil because it rips up the roots. So it's, and they can't afford to grow their own anymore when they can buy it cheaper. But we have to get rid of it, we're obligated. And I'll have more for you in July. Thanks. Thank you. Well, Any other good. business to come before the board? I have a question. Yeah. Are we taking up what we, uh, the information that we got in tonight in, on July 8th? Okay, I was going to, discussion. I, that was just what I was, where I was heading. Okay. We have a uh, joint meeting between us and the uh, 
trustees on July 8th. Um, so at that time, I'd like to leave an opportunity for us to, at that joint meeting, to discuss what we heard here tonight and start the process of where we want to go. Great, thank you. That's a Monday? Excuse me? Monday, July 8th. Yeah. What time? Thank you. Okay. At and, a good, and some of that, 345, some of that meeting will be uh, executive session. Anything else for the board? If not, I would accept to not uh, entertain a motion to. I'll adjourn. make that motion. Motion has been made. I'll second it. And seconded to adjourn. Any further discussion? <laughs> Terry. Thank you. I like that gavel. You like that gavel? <laughs> <laughs> that gavel. Good gavel. All right. Okay. I get, my, get my old auction.